If you have your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to read a passage of Scripture beginning at verse 19 out of the New Living Version of the Bible. So you may have a different version, and that's okay. I personally enjoy the New King James for myself, but I thought this version was apropos for today's message. The Bible says in Galatians 5, beginning at verse 19, graduates, the things your sinful old self wants to do are... Hmm. Sex sins, sinful desire, wild living, worshiping false gods, witchcraft, hating, fighting, being jealous, being angry, arguing, dividing into little groups and thinking other groups are wrong, false teaching, wanting someone, uh, wanting what someone else has, killing other people, using strong drink, wild parties, and all things like these. That's a mouthful. Paul says, I told you before, and I am telling you again, that those who do these things will have no place in the holy nation of God, the kingdom of God. But the fruit that comes from having the Holy Spirit in our lives is love, joy, peace, not giving up, being kind. We see a lot of signs today about just be kind, and we need to understand, hey, that came from the Bible. It, you know, it wasn't someone that just made that up and started putting those signs into yards as if it was original. God said it first, be kind, be kind, being good, having faith, being gentle, and being the boss over your own desires. The law is not against these things. Those of us who belong to Christ have nailed our sinful old selves on his cross. Our sinful desires are now dead. This passage of scripture here is for certain a mouthful. It is. And when you read this passage of scripture, graduates, or you hear this read to you, maybe one of the things that comes to your mind is, wow, there are a lot of do's and don'ts in there. But I want to tell you this morning that the life that you are about to embark on is not about do's and don'ts. The life that you are about to embark on is about how you live that life, the quality of life that you live, what's in your heart, what fruit comes from that. See, the do's and the don'ts are simply the end game, if you will. But we must back up and look at how we got to do this and don't do that. Because it's always the result of something else. You know, we had an opportunity to go to a movie yesterday. I, I did with my daughters, and I really enjoyed it. And I, I love uh, movies. I love going to movies. And, you know, you have to be careful, obviously, going to movies because you don't know what you'll get sometimes. Uh, but, I, but, I, but I do. I, I really enjoy movies. It's a great form of entertainment for me. And um, one of the things that my son, uh, who is not here today, he's out with student life um, traveling, it, it got me into were the superhero movies, you know, and all the Marvel movies and all of that. And so I, I, I enjoyed watching all of the Marvel movies. And I know another one is coming out. Many of you may not know, but uh, I think Black Widow is coming out this summer. Jonathan knows, right? Yeah, exactly. And, um, and I'm, I'm so excited about that because uh, there's nothing that I really enjoy much more than an origin story. Black Widow, this movie that's coming out, is an origin story. It tells how she got started, where she came from, how she became the Black Widow, if you will. And I really love origin stories. I like digging in and finding out how we got to where we are today. Well, when you look at some of the things that we're talking about, you know, that first part of this passage that I read, you see all those things, wild living, worshiping false gods, witchcraft, hating, being kind, killing, you know, um, all of those, those type of things that are all mixed in. You wonder how in the world uh, do we get to those things? And I think we have to go back and look at the origin story. How can we live a life on fire? How can we live a life on fire? How can we live a life that is victorious? And I believe for you guys, the Lord just put uh, four things on my heart that will help you as you launch into life, right? Number one, check your thought life at all times. Check 
your thought life. Check your thought life. You see, having a healthy thought life contributes to having a healthy mind. There's been a lot of emphasis lately, uh, and I've, I've had conversations with a few people about this. There's been a lot of emphasis, emphasis lately on mental health. Haven't you begin to hear a little bit more about mental health? And, but we know that mental health is not something that's new. You know, your, your mental state is not something that's new. It's been around as long as mankind has had a brain, has had a mind. Uh, but there seems to be an emphasis on it, and rightfully so. Uh, but one of the things that I would say about mental health and about, um, you know, taking care of our mind is that God cares about mental health. Mental health is not just something that you see out in the world or you see uh, from a psychologist or a psychiatrist. God cares about your mental health. This is why Paul uh, says what he says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, to think on these things, whatever's trust, trustworthy, whatever's lovely, whatever's praiseworthy, those things. He says to think about those things. Medi in fact, not just think about them, but to meditate on them, and that will help you have a healthy mind. A man named James Allen, who was a writer, among other things, once said that a man is literally what he thinks, his character being the complete sum of all of his thoughts. That is why it's important to make sure that you are thinking on the right track. So have you ever thought about what you thought about? Have you ever intentionally thought about your thoughts? Because there are thoughts that come to your mind all the time. And we can't control what comes into our mind. Sometimes I've told this story. I won't tell it again here today. But, you know, I had an experience one time way back on my honeymoon where this thought just came to my mind. It was just the weirdest thought in the world. And I was wondering why it, this thought came to my mind. And so all kinds of thoughts are going to come to your mind. The question is not what thoughts come to your mind. The question is what do we do with those thoughts that come to our mind? And that's what God is concerned about. That's why he's, he's saying, listen, you have to have the ability to control yourself. Self-control. Self-control even begins in your thought life. So some of the things you can do to help your thought life is to stop negative self-talk and negative behaviors. Uh, we have a lot of negative self-talk, folks. All of us, not just young people. You know, we go through life and how many, how often do you hear, well, I can't do that or, uh, you know, he, he, I'll, I'll, I'm too old for that. Come on. Um, I was, uh, I guess, doing some counseling with one of our pastors over in the Philippines. And, uh, you know, she was talking about going back to school. You know, she's, she's upwards in, in her 40s. And um, I said, why not? That's what was told to me. Why not? Why would you not go back to school? Well, I think I'm too old. I don't think like the young people think. You still have a brain. You still have a mind. You're still open. In fact, you may be better now suited to go to school uh, than even at 18 years old. And so, um, you know, but we tell ourselves all of these things when we go through life. And one of the reasons is we compare ourselves to others. And God never wants you to compare yourself to others. Your life is for you. You can't do it someone else's way. So we just have to stop the negative talk. God doesn't want that. Avoid negative statements. And here's a big one. Take time for fun. What do I mean by that? I mean, even King Solomon said that there's a time for everything. Come on, somebody. There's a time for everything under the sun. One of the issues that I found out in my 50s, as I look back over my life, is that it's not that I had a problem with taking time for whatever it was to take time for, but it is the actual timing of it. There's a time to take time for fun, and very often when it's time to take time for fun, we're doing work. And when it's time to do work, we're having fun. We have to be able to discern the season in our life. But take time for fun. Take time for relaxing. There's enough stress to go around. And even Jesus said, you know, tomorrow has worries of its own. Don't start worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow. Doesn't mean don't plan. Doesn't mean don't think about it. Don't consider it. But don't let it stress you out, as you would say. It has enough worries of its own. Worry about today. <laughs> Practice relaxation techniques. 
And here's a big one. We're talking about mental health. Keep tabs on depression, folks. I'm, I'm saying that from my spiritual, pastoral heart. Keep tabs on it because there are so many things that can get us down. Even as Christians, we know that God is good. We know that we're overcomers. We've read that we're more than conquerors. We've seen that we're the head and not the tail yet. The enemy will put so many things in your mind to get you down and try to wear you down that if we let it, it will throw us into a state of depression, even as a Christian. And we simply can't have that. We simply can't have it. Now, what am I saying? That depression is a bad thing? No, I'm not saying that it will never try to sneak up on you. I'm not saying that you're a bad person if you are or have been depressed. That is not what I'm saying. But I'm saying um, we are not to live in a state of depression because life is to be lived. At some point, we have to think about it. We have to deal with it. We have to allow God to remove it from us. Keep tabs on depression. We must learn to see the connection between negative thoughts and negative emotions and the negative actions that they create. Are we going to continue thinking what we have been thinking, believing what we have been believing, doing what we have been doing, or are we going to make changes? You're just starting your life. You're just launching into your life. And I would say in the words of a famous songwriter, you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. Come on. You must cast down renegade thoughts, folks, no matter how old we are. Wandering thoughts, fugitive patterns of thinking that are defiant, independent, and opposition to the nature and character of what God put in us. We've got to cast those away. Align our emotions to how God wants us to align our emotions. You're an emotional being. Don't get rid of your emotions. Don't cast your emotions away. Just make sure that you are the controller of your emotions and your emotions are not controlling you. That's what we have to do. And so check your thought life at all times. Number two, develop disciplines in your life. Develop some disciplines. You know, it, it's, it, it's, it's interesting as you grow up because you have so many constraints on you. So often it's no. Can I do this? No. Can I do that? No. Well, you know, at this time, you have to go to bed at that time. We have to get up at this time. Yes, you have to go to school. No, you can't quit school. You have to keep going. You know, you have all of these constraints that when you finally graduate, graduate and become an adult, you almost just want to cast off every restraint and just, I'm going to do what I want to do. The way I want to do it, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, and all of those things. And I want to tell you, everyone might not agree with me, but I'm going to tell you those feelings are not altogether odd or even bad. Actually, it's quite natural to have those feelings to be free. But I think that one of the things that you find out is that restraints and limitations are not always bad. We talk a lot about no limits, no limits. Yes, the sky is the limit, or the sky is not a limit. Lecrae said the sky is not a limit, it's a limitation. Come on, there's, there's no limit to what you can do in God, right? But what we also understand is to an extent that is true, but in another way, limitations help us. Even though our box can be a large box, we can move around in that large box. But we'll find that limitations help us from hurting ourselves and killing ourselves. Come on. That's why some limitations are there. And so we need to develop those disciplines in our own life to see what those limitations should be. Don't just allow someone else to put their limitations on you, but don't cast away limitations. Take it in. Chew it up. And see if it's something that God wants you to do if it's a limitation that he wants you to have. You see, making decisions in our life is great. We all should come to a point where we make decisions, okay? At some point, you've got to make a decision. But decisions help you start. Discipline helps you finish. That's why we need some disciplines in our life. And then as you, as you get older, along with that, don't expect others to fight your battles for you. You have all the support you need. You have your parents. You will always, no matter where you go, have your church family, 
God is always by your side and he is always there with you. Even if you are a prodigal, he's always saying, come back. I'm right here. So you always have those that are on your side. But there are moments in your life when you'll look around and you may not be able to call anyone for help. And you can't expect others to fight the battle that's for you because they can't fight it. They won't be able to get over the obstacle that you have in front of you for you. To be an overcomer, you have to get over obstacles. There will be obstacles in your life that you'll have to get over. And you can do it. You have everything you need in you to get over every obstacle that is placed in your way. So develop some disciplines in your life. Number three, and this is a big one, change yourself before you change the world. Wow. Change yourself before you change the world. This reminds me of, I think about the story of David. Many of you know the story of David and uh, the story of him fighting Goliath and how he went to King Saul. And I know you guys know it from, you know, children's church and youth and Sunday school and being in church every Sunday of your life and uh, having to go to church and all of that. I know you know this story, but David, as a young man, went to this battle. He was a shepherd and he went to take his brothers some food and he saw the battle and, and this, this champion that Israel was calling a champion, this guy, Goliath, he was a champion. David came up and said, uh, this uncircumcised Philistine, he called him a, a, a total different thing. This uncircumcised Philistine you're talking about, Saul, King Saul, I can fight this uncircumcised Philistine. Saul said, listen, this man has been a man of war since his youth. You're just a shepherd boy. But since he was little, he's been trained to be a man of war. I'm going somewhere with this one. And you know what David replied with? He didn't shrink back. He didn't shrink back. There'll be times in your life where people will come and say, well, how can you do this? You're just a, you know, you just graduated in social work. You just got your degree. You just got out of high school. You're just now starting. I mean, who are you? But David didn't shrink back. David said, listen, I was keeping the sheep and a lion and a bear came and put the sheep, the little lamb in its mouth. I grabbed the lion by its mane and I bust that lion in the head and killed it. I grabbed the bear. You know how big a bear is? I don't know if you've ever seen a bear in person. I, I haven't and I don't want to unless I'm far away or I have one of Eldon's guns, you know, maybe one of those of... But he grabbed the bear. He said, I bust that bear in the head and killed it. So don't tell me that he's been trained for war. I've been trained as well. I've been trained for war. And then Saul said, okay, all right, all right, look, you want to go fight him? Here, put on this. Here, here's my, my armor and all of my weapons and all of that. And David tried to put it on, and he was smaller than Saul, and it was, it was too uh, big for him. And he just threw it off and said, look, I can't, I can't use your armor. You know, I'm going, to get, I'm going to use what God gave me. Well, what has God given you? Well, I got this slingshot, and I got five smooth stones. What? That's what you're going to use? Yeah, because that's what God gave me to use. So you can't go into the battle with Goliath. You can't go into the battle of life until you're first changed in your own heart. Often we just want to jump out into the fire. I'm ready to go change the world. And God is saying, listen, look in the mirror and change yourself first. Look at your own heart. Allow me to deal with your heart. Allow me to take you through some battles and show you that with me, you can defeat the lion and you can defeat the bear. Uh, allow me to show you that you can't compare yourself to someone else to see how they do it in life. How did they get out of school? How did they get their job? How are they doing their life? No, I have a plan for your life and it may be a slingshot. And you're looking at someone else's armor saying, look at their armor. I want that. And God is saying, no, you're going to do more with your slingshot than that chicken <laughs> will do with all the armor that they have. Now you'll change the world. You are they that are going to turn the world upside down. It will be turned upside down. If you'll take time, look in the mirror, change yourself first. And then lastly, the greatest thing that I can tell you is to walk in faith. It's the greatest gift of word that I can give you. It's the greatest encouragement that I can give you is to walk in faith. There's nothing greater, I can tell you, 
than to walk your life in faith. Walk it in faith. You know, why do we need faith? We know this scripture in Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We've heard that scripture before. This is why we need it, because it's what we hold on to when we don't see things with our natural eyes, but God shows us things in our spirit. Yes, eye is not seen, neither is ear heard, uh, those things that God uh, has for us, but he has revealed it. He will reveal those things to us. Listen to how the message version puts verse 1 and 2 of Hebrews 11. I thought this was very interesting. It said, why do we need faith? Why am I telling you this? Because the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It is our handle on what we can't see. The act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors and set them above the crowd. Faith is the foundation of everything. There are two things that you need in life. You know, when you think about uh, many things like recipes for, uh, you know, maybe a pancake or something. You can, you, can, you can make pancakes with so many different things. You'll find 20 different recipes for pancakes. You'll throw blueberries in there or, you know, chocolate chips uh, in there or whatever it may be. But with, you need flour and eggs and milk, right? I mean, there's some things in every recipe that you can't make it without or it'll turn out to be something else. You have to have it in there. To live a life on fire, to live a life of victory, there are two things that you need, faith and love. You have to have both of those. No faith, you'll not be victorious. There'll be days when you seem victorious, and there'll be days uh, when you just don't know what it's all for. Faith and love. And so we need it. We need faith. Faith also protects us. Ephesians 6, 16, the Bible says, and at all times carry faith as a shield, for with it you'll be able to put out all of the burning arrows shot by the evil one. Faith is your shield. When everyone comes against you with their offenses and their put downs and their negativity and their rejections, the shield of faith is right there to deflect all of those things, not just so you can say, oh, I deflected it, I'm just going to sit here. No, but so you can continue to go forward, deflecting everything as you walk on water through the storm. Your shield of faith is what deflects all of those things. And what we need to understand about faith is that faith is an action word. Faith is an action word. James put it this way in James chapter 2. He said, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but, but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Faith is the core of living an abundant life. We must have faith, and we must have faith in God. Why am I telling you this? It's because he's the one that created you. He's the one that breathed the breath of life in you. Now, I want to just give you give a, a moment um, to just the graduates. Uh, I just want to speak into your life for just a moment, something that's near and dear to my heart. And um, it may be something that you don't receive, some of you, right now. But I'm going to put it in your ear hole, and it's going to go into your mind, and it's going to get in your spirit. Once it's there, nothing you can do about it. So don't close your ears right now so we can get in there. <laughs> I'm going to say four words to you. Don't give up. I'll say five words. Don't give up on church. See, what we have to understand is that when you grow up in church, as I did, I, I'm speaking from experience. At some point, 
church itself becomes a routine. Especially when you're told to go to church. Especially when you have no choice but to go to church. At some point, it becomes routine. And some of us have forgotten that there are times in your life where you begin to question. Some of you say, I never question. I never, I have faith. I've always had faith. Okay, then, then you're a great person. But it's not my testimony. There were times in my life where I did question and say, what is all of this? I mean, I, I believe God. Is there a God? I do believe God. Is there a God? Yes, I do believe that there is a God. Come on, I'm talking real now. I mean, if we're going to empower them for a life on fire, we have to be real. I mean, as real as I know God is, we have to be real about our questions and some of the doubts that the enemy puts into our mind. We have to understand that when you grow up in church in the manner that all of these young people grew up in church, there will be times when they get off of the path. There will be times when they question and they want to find out for themselves. You cannot give them your faith. The Bible does not say that by the faith of Father Michael. It says by the faith of Jesus Christ in Galatians 2.20, Brother James. So it has to be God's faith that is planted in them and not our faith. And so that is why I'm telling you, no matter what you go through in life, I know some of the things that you have thought, some of them. I don't know everything that's gone through your minds. I know some of the things that you may be thinking now about church and about God and about spirituality and about life and about what I'm going to do. I've always been a person that, and it's been a flaw, and I'm not saying you have a flaw, I'm talking about me. I've always been a person that wanted to do what was next. It was always like, well, I can't wait till Friday. We were working all week, and then Friday, the weekend is coming. And when that weekend came, I thought about what else was going to happen the next weekend. You know, and now it's summertime. I can't wait for football season. But I hate the snow, but I still can't wait for football. And then when football season came, I couldn't wait for Christmas to come. And then when Christmas comes, I can't wait for Easter because I know it'll be spring. And then I can't wait for the 4th of July, and I can't wait, and I can't wait. And I always want to do what's next. And all of a sudden, I'm 50 waiting to see what's next. <laughs> Shock, right, Durant? <laughs> and so we begin to wish our life away. We begin to, what's next? I know I'm going to do what's next. And there are times, and this is an old cliche, where you have to stop and smell the roses. Enjoy life, because Jesus came that you would have an abundant life. So with that, I'm telling you, all the things that you have been through, don't give up on church. And I'm going to say this, and, a, and a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of those guys out there might not like it, but don't judge church totally by the people. Okay? Don't judge church totally by the people. Yes, the people, we are important. Of course, we make up the church. We are the church. I know that. But don't judge church totally by the people because church is made up of imperfect people. If you want to judge church at all, judge it, but judge it by its leader. See, he's never failed. In fact, when they killed him, he rose from the dead. But not before spending three days preaching to captives that had died before him and took them captivity. Come on. Jesus was compassionate and kind. He was harsh to those that came against him and what he was trying to do with people. Jesus was harsh against the religious leaders and forgiving to sinners. Those who committed sin. Of course he had standards, go and sin no more. But he was compassionate. If you want to follow anybody, follow that person. Follow that person. I mean, uh, listen, I know I'm a little biased, but I want to tell you Buddha is dead. He had some good things to say. I, you know, he had some clever sayings, but Buddha is dead. All right. Confucius died. Okay. All of those people, heads of all of other religions, none of them rose from the grave. The only one, the only one that had the audacity and what I call the unmitigated gall to stand up in front of the world and say that I am the truth, I am the way, and I am the life. 
No one comes to the Father except by me. That's why. That's why I follow Jesus. That's why I follow him. And that's why I'm encouraging you today to not give up. I'm not telling you today that you're going to be some spiritual giant or you're going to start running around church or you're going to be anything other than what you are and what God is making you to be. All I'm telling you is to leave your heart open. Don't judge church solely by the people. Judge it by its leader and its master. Leave your heart open to what God would have for your life because God is a blessing to you. Amen. Amen.